It is a Friday, which means it's time for the KSO Show, and we get you prepped and primed for K-State and Texas Tech. The Wildcats trying to get back on track. They got to have this win to make the season feel like it's going back in the direction that people wanted. They also need just individual performances that breed confidence in fans and coaches and whoever, because it was not a pretty sight the last time they played football, and they get that extra day to prepare for Texas Tech, who is the opponent. Every game that K-State has played against Texas Tech with Chris Kleiman has just kind of been an interesting one. The Wildcats win those games, but they're close enough to make you give, you know, a little little concern. But K-State's always done enough to pull them out. And I'm sure if that would happen this week, you would absolutely take it if you're a Wildcat. But welcome into the KSO Show. I'm Mason Voth, joined by Derek Young. If you're joining us for the first time, we are with K-State Online, part of On3, where you can find all of our great work over there, mainly the written stuff from Drew and D. Wise, the good stuff. My mine is questionable. You can you know yell at me for power rankings or if I'm too nice uh, on the quarterback uh, when giving a grade every week. But uh, this is going to be a, a pretty telling game for K State this weekend, D. Y. And before we dive into anything that we think is going to work, anything that won't work, uh, what is the the main overarching theme or take that you have heading into this game for K State? that it is definitely going to dictate the direction of the season, or at least how it feel feels like for fans, maybe even the players, because you win, you can say, Hey, we're two and one in the big 12, four and two overall. And you know, we're two weeks from being four and one. Cause if you, if you beat, if you beat Texas tech on the road, you should be able to be t, t, very gettable games. there, were TCU and Houston at home, mm-hmm. especially now since the, the trickier one of those two, would be the Big 12 championship rematch with the Frogs, who are probably going to be without their starting quarterback in Manhattan. So the deck kind of clears after the tilt in Lubbock. So it's this is a game of great opportunity and basically to revive the season if you're Kansas State, much like we saw maybe Oklahoma State do last week uh, in Stillwater against the, the Wildcats or what Texas Tech did when they responded by beating Baylor and Houston in convincing fashion. So we've seen this a a few times from Big 12 teams already this year. It's Kansas State's turn. Will they answer the bell? Yeah, I mean, this is this is huge for them. They they got to prove that they can bounce back and that they can kind of channel everything and and be ready to go. Uh, One of the things that is most notable heading into this is going to be how K-State's offense looks starting out. It was weird because Every other game to start the year, things had gone fine that first drive. K-State came out. They looked focused. They had a plan in place. Everything they did worked. They had scored touchdowns on the first drive of every game in the first four games of the season. But everything changed in Stillwater. They came out. Things did not look good. Looked really lame, disjointed, bland, boring, whatever you want to use to describe it. And K-State didn't come away with points. They gave it to Oklahoma State, who immediately went down and scored. And all the momentum was given away on a big night game uh, for a team in Oklahoma State that they needed that win last week to really start to to feel like things could maybe turn in a different direction. So, I mean, uh, are, do you have any concerns about K-State starting out strong again? Like, is that going to be something that's tough to get back? They had all this goodwill and momentum to start games, but now that things went south one time, are, are, should we be worried about them kind of getting that groove back? I'm not because – of the like the reaction that I saw, the anger that I saw, the disgust that I saw, the disappointment that I saw from whether it be Chris Kleiman or some of the players that we have spoken to since that game. And look, I I would be downright concerned and also shocked if we didn't see a more inspired effort. Well, I mean the Yes, the effort thing. And Chris Kleiman, it was weird. You know, yesterday he was asked about the effort. And we're recording this on, I guess it was a couple of days ago. Um, but he was asked about the effort, and he felt like he didn't see any effort problems out there. Is that him being truthful, or do you think that's him kind of in some way protecting the narrative and not wanting it to to seem like there is a true effort issue? Because I, I think that there maybe was, or at least a uh, – a sense of urgency was not there early in that game for, yeah. for the way things looked. I, I Well, I don't think he wanted to acknowledge it publicly. I think that would be a little bit 
damning on his part. He, he's got to be careful to walk that line. And I understood that. And when I say inspired effort, I don't know that there's a literally an, an effort problem. I think there's a desire to win, a desire to play hard for the most part across the board. And I think some guys need to better maintain focus from start to finish in a ball game. But like effort, just like trying hard or, or caring, I don't think that is a problem. So I would probably agree with Chris Kleiman on that part. But the the phrase that you said there that probably is what I would want to see a bit more of, uh, and, and I'll use one of my own as well, but you said a sense of urgency. I like that. That's probably what they were lacking or intensity. Maybe you're, yeah. you're or, or even purpose, like purpose, play with purpose, play with intensity. I think we, I, I, I think we can see a good start from Kansas State because I, I'd be stunned if they didn't come out with that based on what they trotted out a week ago. And uh, quite frankly, I bet that they were probably embarrassed by what that looked on tape and now have a point to prove. I think I, I think that's probably that's probably a good way to put it, the intensity that they need because I, I that's probably what you lacked. I mean, you go in there and you're facing a team that, there's no way it's impossible for, you know, as bad as Oklahoma state had been and everything they had shown to not go into that and have somewhat of a thought in your head that we should win this thing pretty comfortably. This isn't going to be like other Oklahoma state teams we've played in the past. And maybe that's the difference between this year's game with Oklahoma state and last year's is last year you're facing a top 10 team that had just beaten Texas the week prior. Meanwhile, you had just lost at TCU in a heartbreaking fashion, and you're thinking, well, now things could really start to tumble because if we lose this game, that's two in a row. We can't have that. So I'm guessing the focus and the energy and the intensity, it was at a high level that entire week and into the game. We, we saw that. I mean, K-State was pedal to the metal. They went for it on fourth down early in that game, hit the bomb to Cade Warner. This year, it's a totally different deal for K-State. You had just blown the, the doors off UCF in the second half. You got a bye week to kind of sit around and wait up, and now you're playing a team that you see that they're they're not anywhere close to as good as they've been in the past. And so I think it's just natural, and it's easy to assume that K-State maybe lacked that. And I don't think it was intentional. I just think it's one of those things that happens. You know, like you you know you kind of sit there and you think oh, I'm going to mess around for a little bit, and then oh, oh no, I need to get on this. Like we've all had that. Whether it's you know when you're when you're in school and you're sitting there and it's like I got time, I got time. Then all of a sudden. It's 10.30 at night on a, on a Tuesday, and you're like, oh, this assignment has to be done at 11.59. I better get on it. Or, you know, I'm, I'm the oldest of, of three boys in my family, so I've got younger brothers playing basketball in the driveway, and, you, you know, you're playing the one that's six years older than you, and you're trying to make it interesting, and then you find yourself, it's like, oh, well, if he lucks in a bucket here or something, then he wins this game. Like, I can't let that happen. You just kind of ease back. It's natural to do in certain situations. I think that happened to K-State, and – it's not a good thing that it happened, but at the very least, I would assume that they correct a lot of those problems that got them in the early hole against Oklahoma State on the effort and intensity side because you have to have this game in Lubbock, or at least you feel like you do. And if if they don't go out and do this in Lubbock, then I find it impossible that it would be because of intensity or anything like that. It would truly just be a signal that K-State can't get it done. Like if they put out a performance that replicates what happened in Stillwater, it's this time it wouldn't be on the effort or energy thing. It would solely just be on they're not a good football team right now, and and they can't make those things happen. Yeah, not that it's ex excusable or forgivable. It's a mistake, but clearly, Oklahoma State didn't have the same attention from Kansas State as it as they did last year, and, and that played into it. Yeah. No, I think that's uh, I think that's that's probably the case. All right, in terms of Texas Tech and how we we see things playing out here for them, uh, TCU, who is going to be the opponent next week, we know will be playing a backup quarterback. UCF played a backup quarterback. Texas Tech will be starting a backup quarterback against the Wildcats. Tyler Shutt got hurt in their loss at West Virginia to start Big Twelve play, but Baron Morton stepped in and he's been able to secure back to back victories now for the Red Raiders in conference play. Baron Morton is a guy that has experience playing. I mean, he did it last year, and uh, he was the one that kind of quarterbacked them through a handful of games after Shuck and Donovan Smith both spent time uh, injured and dealing with problems. So 
What, what do you make of what we should expect from the Texas Tech offense? Because they also have a really, really good running back this year, and their run game is uh, probably going to be of bigger emphasis at times, which honestly might be beneficial to K-State because – that's the one area that you probably feel best about still defensively, even though the defense did kind of get burnt a little bit uh, by Ollie Gordon and the, the O-State running attack last week. It's a good question. And, uh, yeah, for Texas Tech offense, it's kind of the inverse of what you would typically anticipate from what you're going to get from the Red Raiders, where they're kind of synonymous with the, you know, the, the air raid offense and throwing it 60 times and, and running it like two two times. But uh, you're not getting that this year because they've had to adapt and kind of modify their approach, some of that because they did lose Tyler Shuck um, with another season-ending injury uh, that he, I think, suffered against West Virginia in Morgantown. So <laughs> it's a run-oriented team, uh, a little less QB run now without Shuck, and probably rightfully so. I mean, Taj Brooks is apparently a stud, so – for Texas Tech, uh, they're not as good through the air, and some of that's you're playing an inexperienced quarterback. Now, not zero experience, but still a guy in Baron Morton who hasn't played a ton of football. But you got a running back that's really carving teams teams up right now. <laughs> yeah, I mean that it, it's it's certainly a, a concern, and there was a lot of uh, love and hype throughout the start of the season, at least for Taj Brooks. And you know, I think Texas Tech the last handful of years has been. Um, maybe maybe they're properly rated. Most people give them their due, but I've thought pretty highly of the running backs that they've thrown out there in recent years. And certainly Roderick. those running backs have had good games against K-State at least. I mean, Sir Roderick Thompson felt like his name was getting said a lot in games that the Wildcats matched up with Texas Tech. So let, let's dive into it here. What I mean, we've talked about a lot of negative this entire week. So let's get this thing started off with some positives. What are you at least more confident and that K-State is able to actually accomplish and do against Texas Tech on the offensive side of the ball because it was nasty watching that offense play last week. So is there anything that you expect that they can actually be successful with this week or that they might try differently to make sure the offense looks better? I would I would just imagine they're a little bit more crisp. You don't, you don't have essentially every position group playing their worst game at the same time. Like – that's kind of what happened. I mean, we a lot of people want to just slam Will Howard. Hey, he didn't play well. But guess what? The offensive line was poor. The receivers were poor. Everyone decided to play their poorest at the same time, and that's why it looked as bad as it did. And even then, you have the ball the chance to tie it at the end of the, at the, end of the game to, on two different occasions. So it's been a wacky year, but what they really need to get back to doing is executing at a greater clip, having less self-inflicted mistakes, taking care of the ball. Um, you know, the little things, just playing more crisp, not co having a near collapse so many times. So for me, it's just not necessarily a certain area. It's just playing cleaner where that's not turning it over not missing on things that you don't normally miss on and, you know, like blown blocks, but, you know, drop balls, penalties, turnovers, just eliminate those. And you're not having drives stunted by self-inflicted errors. And it's then, and instead they extend it and maybe you pop off an explosive. So for me, it's, just staying on schedule and not beating themselves by self-inflicted mistakes. Yeah, I, I think, you know, at this point, you look around and you say, we've not been a big play team all season. That, that's clear with what the receiving situation looks like. It, your best bet is to get somebody to pop off a big run. And that can still happen. But I, I think right now, and, and this may be tough, and the expectation was different coming into the year, is that, this offense would probably throw the ball a lot more than it has in the past, which it has to this point, and that that would be more of a focal point given who your quarterback was and how Colin Klein was doing things differently with the offense. But I think this is a game where you just have to go in and say, hey, we're, we're going to try and just you know control this game, and if it takes us 15 plays to go down and score, let's do it. Like let, 
let's make sure kind of to the same vein of what you're saying, like don't beat ourselves and, and how they were beating themselves last week in Stillwater was by giving the ball away by, you know, having some, and I won't even say complex like situations on offense when they're throwing the football. It's just, they weren't, they weren't in sync. So the, the message this week from Chris Kleiman has been to simplify things. Well, simplify things and hey you know if if the best way to move the ball for you right now is three yards here with dj giddens and then you know four yards with you know ben Sennett just popping off the line and hitting him and and letting him get knocked down after a little bit and then you try and bully your way to the next three and pick up the first down and move move the sticks like i think that's what you have to do so I, i think this is probably i would almost expect a more methodical look from the k state offense this week Maybe not because of what they want to do, but because they realize that it's just what they have to do at this point in time. Like now, I know we, we've we've discussed like, do you just try and get Keegan Johnson involved in more ways, like try and force feed him some? Maybe. I just really think that the best move right now is probably to go out there and you say, hey, we're, we're okay with taking up a lot of time. It's a little bit different than what we've done this season, and not how we anticipated having to play. But the game has changed for K State. And this game against Texas Tech is really important. So I, I would expect that this is probably a game where we get uh, a lot more use out of running backs from K-State than what we've seen over the last couple of games. I mean, the UCF game was a little bit different, but they still wanted to put the ball in the air. I think they're going to try and, and do some things a little bit differently here. It's just a matter of how willing is Texas Tech going to be to you know let that happen. I mean, the one thing to – to be mindful of is tech has been pretty good against the run this year at different points. The only team though, that I would really give much credence to is how they did against Oregon with that. Cause everybody else, I, I don't know what to take away from Houston and Baylor's games. Like they, they got to play the two worst teams in the big 12 right now. Well, maybe UCF is in that conversation, but uh, that's, I, I just, I think, my my brain is in shambles trying to comprehend what's going on with K-State right now because it shouldn't be as bad as it was on Friday night in Stillwater, and the solution seems to be to do one thing, but the game might dictate you to go another. But I would just say that they're going to have to be a lot less particular about what they're looking for downfield. Like, like I said, a, a lot more things that set up guys to be open 10, 10 yards or less off the line of scrimmage and seeing what happens, just be okay with taking what's there. Um, because I think now you're going to see a lot of teams that are willing to try and bait Will Howard even more into making some throws that could get him into some trouble. And uh, also you could confuse these receivers and really get them thrown off. So we'll, we'll see kind of how the offense plays out. A lot, a lot of what's contributed. There's a lot of things contributing to the poorest passing attack some of that was will howard not throwing the ball on time when he did throw it on time he wasn't always accurate when he did throw it on time was accurate he didn't make the right decisions when he did all three of those the receiver would run a wrong route if the receiver ran a right route the offensive line didn't block it like there's a lot of things that have to go right and have to go well for a passing attack to be to do well you have to get enough protection. Receiver has to run the right route. Receiver, receiver has to make the right read. He has to catch the ball. The quarterback has to throw it on time. He has to be accurate. He has to make the right read. He has to make the right decision. I just made passing the football sound very complex. And we see teams. It is complex for K State right yeah. now. And we see teams do it every week, so it's not necessarily a complex things, but you have to execute a lot of different things in order to have an effective passing game. And one little thing going wrong disaffects it or affects it in a negative way. So it's 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 about that crispness, that cohesion, and everyone being on the same page and kind of doing their job and not worrying about anything else. We'll see how it how it ends up going. I mean, we we've talked about it, I guess, a little bit inside of this. Is I mean, do you still have like I know it was bad and, and everything else, so that's why I'm not as overly concerned about the offense. I mean, I'm still concerned. Like, I don't want anybody to think that this entire week I'm not in the same boat as you, where you're worried about K 
K-State being a good football team still. I have those same concerns. I'm just not panicking, I think, as much as some. And yeah. I think some people would want that. I mean, w- what what concern is the biggest that is still bleeding into this week for you for K-State where you're skeptical that that's going to change for the game with Texas Tech? And it may be something that they need to do well this week that you just don't think they're going to be able to achieve. Turnovers, because now – if you want a glass half full look, Texas Tech doesn't really force them, so that that's a good thing. But you're Neither always did Oklahoma more, State. Yeah, you're almost you're always like more vulnerable and susceptible to it on the road because of the environment, the noise, the crowd. It's a night game. It's going to be crazy in Lubbock at Jones AT and T Stadium, uh, and uh, it's been a problem and a poor trend for Kansas State at this point. And I don't think that they can win on the road in Lubbock against Texas Tech against a team that's feeling good about themselves without being plus in turnover margin. Yeah, I mean, and that's that was something Chris Kleiman immediately talked about after the game in Stillwater was they just haven't been able to force turnovers on their own. So in in that vein, uh, the K-State defense, it, it's, it's weird to kind of dissect what they did in Stillwater where there were actually things to look at and say, hey, that's pretty big positive especially when you consider they were without their top two corners for the second half of that game they started without Jacob Parrish then they lost Will Lee in the second quarter um where where does your your confidence and and faith in the K-State defense lie based off what you're going to see in Texas Tech which is a team that uh, Taj Brooks is probably going to be their main focus right now but they still like to throw the ball and it's not like Baron Morton is you know freshman Will Howard out there being fed to the Wolves. Baron Morton has done this a time or two, and uh, he, he's more than capable when he's out on the field. Yeah, and he has arm talent. His problem, which will be interesting to, to monitor, is sometimes has been ball security. So it'll and, – and he's not as dangerous with his legs as, as Tyler Shook was either. So um, a little bit more gettable in the pocket. For Kansas State, I, I think – even if you do have Jacob Parrish back, you, you worry about your lack of length at the corner position without Will Lee, just because I mean Texas Tech's best receiver is Miles Price, and I think he's six foot five, two hundred and twenty pounds. Mm-hmm. Not sure there's a good matchup on the Kansas State defense for him if Texas Tech wants a spotlight and scheme ways to get him the ball. Um, that's going to be a pretty difficult matchup for the Wildcats, regardless. So being down Will Lee probably exacerbates that issue but it'll be interesting if texas tech chooses to attack in that way because as we already described they've been much more willing to be a grounded pound team this year rather than hey baron morton let's throw the ball 30 times all right well another thing defensively that's interesting in this game last week drew had set our over under on sacks at three and a half and we all took the over. K State didn't record a single one, yeah. and it was you know weird that K State was still leading the Big Twelve in sacks because it, it felt like that was a weak spot at times. They've just it's come in bunches for them. Is K State going to be able to get to the quarterback when the opportunity presents itself on Saturday night? It'll be difficult, but it might be more dependent on Texas Tech. Um, I think they have an improving offensive line, not not necessarily an elite an elite group. Um, but they do get rid of the ball in a hurry. Um, that they don't, Baron Morton doesn't hold on to it very long. And as we said, they'll, they'll run the ball quite a bit. And the reason why Kansas State was a little porous in terms of sack production and affecting the quarterback was because Oklahoma State got rid of the ball quickly, but also because Kansas State is playing off, playing pretty soft right now in terms of coverages and defense and probably a little less willing to send pressure and send blitzes because of how vulnerable they have been to allowing explosive plays. Um, if you're if you're a defense that's allowing a lot of explosive plays and it's affecting your ability to win football games, you to to try to win games, your adjustment will be to play off more and keep everything in front of you to prevent those because that's your path to win. So 
it will come down to how Kansas State, how aggressive Kansas State wants to play, whether they are sending pressures or whether they're going to, you know, be cognizant of not allowing the big play against Texas Tech. Because if you have that soft coverage, it's easier to dink and, and dunk. And, and Texas Tech already gets rid of the ball pretty quickly. And like I said, they're they're kind of morphing into more of a ground and pound team with Taj Brooks in the backfield. Yeah. Uh well, in in terms of of how this works out, Tech is the second worst at protecting the quarterback in terms of sacks in the Big 12 this year. Uh, they've given up now 14 through the the six games that they've played. Baylor is the only team that is worse. They've given up 18 sacks already this year. So maybe there's a chance for K-State, but I, I think what you said there about determining how much pressure you bring and kind of putting your corners and the coverage on an island is is something to, to think about. Although one of the things Chris Kleiman did say earlier this week was talking about how, you know, the coverage was too soft uh, against Oklahoma state, even though they, you know, they did a whole lot of bending, but they didn't break too many times. Maybe that's something where there are a couple points in the game where they do decide, Hey, we're going to, we're going to test this. We're okay. If, if a big play happens here, like let's let's give it a go and, and send a little extra pressure because tech is vulnerable there and just hope that somebody's able to step up and make a play. That's probably going to be something that I bet we find out pretty early in the game is how willing is K-State to send the extra guy when Texas Tech is passing? And how many situations do we see the corners uh in where you know they're they're kind of all on their own or they're they're in a spot where <laughs> They uh, they could get burnt really bad if things don't go correctly on that play, but that's probably something that I would uh, keep an eye on because I think it is going to be a key. It's not just those guys being able to kind of plug things up front now. I think it's clear that K-State's defense, even though things tighten up, if they want to get off the field, you have to do some things to push the other team back more. And that the easiest way to do that is when they go back to throw the ball and you get to the quarterback, which also in turns, as we've talked about, uh, from last year's team that they were successful at. Last year's pass rush created a lot of the turnover opportunities for K-State secondary, where you know you got Brendan Mott or Felix Andy DK Uzama in your face, and so you're just flinging up a prayer where it's a, a weak softy, and it's it's an easy pick for some guys. You need more of that if you're K-State, and they didn't make Alan Bowman do that last week uh, after they did it okay against Timmy McLean and UCF the week prior. So, um, K-State's pass rush, I think, is probably going to be the ultimate key right now just because we're almost halfway through the season. They will be after the game in Lubbock on Saturday night, and nothing from the secondary, although it hasn't been as bad, has shown me that you can still feel really good about that. You need to be able to feel good about the guys that are experienced up front that were anticipated on having some of the serious talent for you. Uh, like Khalid Duke and Brendan Mott and Nate Matlack, and and those guys need to bring it a little bit more. Yeah, they do. Uh, at least play more consistent. Yeah, because I think I mean that's I think it's come and burst. I think when things are going well, it's like an avalanche for K State that things work out, and if they aren't, then they're they're dead silent. We're not getting a whole lot from it, so we'll just have to see how it uh, ends up working out in terms of individual play in this game on Saturday for K-State. We know Will Howard is going to have the big focus. We've talked a lot this week about the quarterback situation, how things need to get handled. Uh, what is your your expectation for how he comes out and plays against Texas Tech? Ooh, that's a mystery, right? Like he, he is a very polarizing player, not just in how people feel about him, but it, but in his performance, if you think about some of his worst games and some of his best games, I, I think you'd trade those worst games for just a little bit more consistent production than even if it's not elite is is a rung below. So uh, he has to work on some consistency in his own right. Uh, very hot and cold kind of guy. I mean, there was not a hotter quarterback in the big 12 for sure in the last five or six games of the season, uh, he could do very little wrong. The timing was great. The anticipation was great. The, the arm strength was great. The decisions were great. Uh, he pushed the right buttons. He knew when to be aggressive and when not to be aggressive. 
And some of that has just been lost this year. So he has to kind of regain that form or else there's going to be tougher questions ahead. What I what I will watch, I, I don't necessarily know what I'm going to get from him because he's such a polarizing player. Sorry, I'm losing my voice here. Mm-hmm. Is that I wonder if – I think we saw this from Adrian Martinez, like a, a overcorrection. And we saw him probably play too conservative for the first half of last season. Like he was playing well, mm-hmm. okay, solid, but the offense lacked explosiveness through the air because he was unwilling to take shots. What I hope doesn't happen is that we see an overcorrection from Will Howard. I still want him to take shots. Now, Knowing Will Howard, he does have a little gunslinger to him. That that probably won't be the case, but it is something to keep in mind. It's interesting that you bring that up because I mean you're right, and I I, I don't know how the how to 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 look at it because I would have said that Adrian Martinez didn't lose them games last year, but his lack of wanting to throw the ball and attack did probably lose them the two lane game. Um, there weren't many chan- g- opportunities there where he was right. trying to force it and, and make something happen. Absolutely. But another interesting part of last season and how it unfolded, I think the best game I can remember from a quarterback was probably Will Howard against Oklahoma State when they won 48-0. Mm-hmm. The second best one may be the best. I, like I, I think Adrian Martinez against Oklahoma yeah. might have been might have even been better than Will Howard against Oklahoma State. Yeah, and he came out and immediately it was the obviously the legs were great in that game for him, but he threw the ball really well from start to finish in that game and made some plays. And I, I'm just I'm going to be interested in, in seeing how he handles it because the problem is for K State, Adrian Martinez came in after you know years and years of being beaten down about his turnover problem at Nebraska and being told it was his fault. So his problem was over three non conference games that weren't all that meaningful at the end of the day, you know, like it, it, whatever. And so when it was his moment where it was like, yo, wake up, you got to do something different here. Like be aggressive. You can do this. It was in big 12 play. If Will Howard comes out and you know, the concern is, Oh, being conservative and all this and not turning the ball over, you got a real problem because that, that will take some time then to correct back the other way. You can't have that happen right now. I think it's learning on the fly and it's, I don't know. And this is why I I put a a lot more on the receivers than other people want to. I think everybody just wants to clean their hands of it and say, this is Will Howard's fault. He sucks. He's just not good. This is, this is what Will Howard was. Those seven games in 2022 were a fluke, whatever. I I don't side with this, but like the, some of the throws that he got burnt on at Oklahoma state, they just, they were so bad because of both people having blame and, you would say, okay, well, you know, hang on to it. Don't throw that ball. But some of the balls then that you're saying he can't throw because of how the receivers are playing are pretty simple balls that if he doesn't do it, he's probably getting sacked or something else is going to have to happen that's not a good outcome. I I just think he's in a in a can't win situation right now. And that that's not a good thing. And again, part of it he has brought on himself 100 percent He was not good on Friday night. But there is a whole other element to this, which we've talked about as well this week, where receivers got to step up. It's clear that Chris Kleiman believes that based off of the things that he's said and done. And I'm going to be fascinated to see uh, probably more than Will Howard how that group looks on Saturday night because at some point they need to do something this year. I mean, outside of Torch and Simo, you know, an Ohio Valley team from the FCS level, the receivers have not done a whole lot to say, oh, that's impressive this year. And they're the ones that honestly need to pull their weight more than anybody on the offense right now, I think, because as bad as the decision-making was at times for Will Howard, he made bad decisions because of his receivers, and he was at least still able to run it well against Oklahoma State, and you had that going for you. So I think the receivers are the ones that probably need to step up because if they don't make any strides, then even the simple throws that Will Howard is going to still need to make, even if he's trying to – ease back on being aggressive and turning the ball over he's not going to be able to do or if he still does them bad things will still happen and and k-state will get taken advantage of in that department it's it's a bad situation they're in right now 
Yeah, I, I just want to. I just wonder if some of it we're overreacting too much to one game, too. So that's why I, I, I think I'll be able to have a more firm takeaway or conclusion after this Saturday night. I mean, I think there's definitely a part of that. I think everybody is going to play a really nasty, crappy game, or at least almost every team will this season in the Big 12 at some point. Every team in the country will do that at some point. It's just some are better to where it's not going to turn into losses, or others will have it happen in games where their opponent also plays to that level. I mean, you know, like there's a chance that on Saturday, KU goes to Stillwater and KU plays their worst game of the year. But I don't think Oklahoma State is going to stack a second good game on top of what they did last week. So they could go get a bad Oklahoma State and their worst game could still end up in a win in a spot where K-State played their worst game and it didn't. That kind of stuff happens all the time. I mean, Georgia can go out and they can play their worst game of the year against Vanderbilt. But guess what? They aren't losing to Vanderbilt no matter at what level Vanderbilt is able to play at. Um, But, you know, if like K-State, that's just how games and sports and everything works. Uh, so they're going to have to just you know hope it doesn't happen again. The only reason I think so many people are on edge is because issues that were a problem in Stillwater, you can find various other points throughout this season or prior seasons where the people involved have had that same issue. Like there have been I, questions and concerns about the receivers all year. Same for the offensive line. Will Howard has still has more bad games he's played at quarterback than good ones at K-State under his belt. So it's easy for people to just kind of slip that belt back on and say, hey, oh, this guy's not very good. So I I think that's why everybody has gotten to that point. But I I am with you where we have to see what happens against Texas Tech, where if they come out and play a good game, then it's a little bit easier to say, okay, they just played a really bad one against Oklahoma State. Yes, there are problems, but they're never going to be as bad as they were on that Friday night in Stillwater again this year. And if that's the case, even in a loss – I'll feel a lot better about the season moving forward for K-State because that's where you keep perspective and say, okay, you lost two in a row, whatever, but you're coming home. You got two winnable games. You can be, uh, you know, what would that put them at? Put them at three and two, and then you're just, you're gearing up and hoping that maybe you're ready and prepared and at a better state where you can go compete with Texas and anything can happen. But even then, you know, eight and four is still not a bad year for K-State. It's just, they're in a position where they should be achieving a lot more relative to the rest of this league right now, and expectations are elevated for them. I would agree. I think, I, I, and this, I mean, kids, they could go lay another dud in Lubbock, and, and this sounds stupid. So I'm not even guaranteeing that they won't do that. Um, I don't think they'll lay another egg, but uh, there are there are <laughs> there are no guarantees in college football. But what I will say is, as a trap that some get into is. And I think part of it is contributed by everyone knowing or, or believing that Oklahoma State's a pretty bad football team. Mm-hmm. So you just lost to her, you know, who all three of us, I believe, had last in our Big 12 yeah. power since last week. I was like, well, if you lose to them, like, the, the, then we must be that bad. Um, or everyone makes the assumption that the product that Kansas State puts on the field against Oklahoma State will now be the product that they put on the field the remaining few games or remaining seven games. And it, it's just not the case. It's more likely that that will be the worst game that Kansas State plays and they'll play better every other game, um, better than the, better than the one they did in Stillwater. So, um, but it'll take a much better performance than that to win in Lubbock. So that that's the challenge at hand. Yep. Nope. I would, uh, I would agree with that. Uh, all right, let's move on real quick. We'll dive into our uh, our best bets. It did not go w- – well, it wasn't horrible last week, I don't think, uh, but I, I just had a really bad one that I thought was going to uh, go well. Uh, I don't know if you uh, recall, D.Y., but I had Miami minus 20 and a half. Um, do, you, do you remember at all what Miami did last week? Uh, it, you can recap it for everybody because it was uh, – it was yeah. it was a lot of hilarity that took place. Well, well, to be fair, your your, uh, your bet did not have a chance at covering. No, so. it did not have a chance at covering. It it just was more comical. Uh, it was comical in, in the, the pick itself. Then I, I'm I'm wearing this week uh, on this case I show the North Carolina Tar Heels. Uh, Mac Brown sporting sporting the heels this weekend. They're playing Miami um, 
after the collapse as Mario Cristobal with the other team having zero timeouts and the other team being Georgia Tech, one of the worst teams in the ACC, in less than 40 seconds on the clock, mind you. So a knee literally would be the last play of the game if he takes a knee. Instead, his his offensive coordinator runs a play out so that they hand it off. Questionable call. Not enough in the replay to overturn it, though, I would agree. So they fumble it. The other team picks it up. Even more mind-numbing to me was how the Georgia Tech throw a bomb. Like, the Yellow Jackets are not explosive passing offense. So yeah. how they literally got a guy wide open when that's the one thing that they needed to hit is beyond me. But they throw a touchdown pass and win the game. So Miami literally had a victory within their grasp in let Mario Cristobal, for the second time in his career, by the, by the way, uh, take it away from his own team. So um, pretty bizarre. Um, Way to lose. Now, it would have been worse for you if that's how you lost the cover. So Yeah, that would have been. That would have been really stupid uh, if that had gone down. Uh, we both went one and two last week. I had Miami, you know, whatever. And then uh, Keegan Johnson did not score a touchdown in the game. Tech, plus one and a half at Baylor. They more than covered that. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, what were what was mine? Do you, remember? Uh, you had the first quarter over in K-State, Oklahoma State of ten and a half. They got to 10, hey. thanks to Oklahoma <laughs> State. Uh, you did get Miami of Ohio. They beat Bowling Green 27 nothing. so you had them a, a minus 11.5. And, and then you had TCU over 30.5 at Iowa State. Under. No, that was under. under. No, you did. Oh, you did have the under. Okay, so you did hit. hit that one. I yeah. still I screwed myself up again by looking at the wrong number there. Okay, you did yep. hit that one because, what, they only scored 14 last week? Yeah, so no. that that was one of my better bets. And we, we were saying, like, my, my point totals have been – well, for lack of a better term, on point. Well, I got one today. Yeah, speaking of point totals, there's a look if you're watching on the YouTube of D-Wise. Uh, I mean, two of them, you're like, oh, those are pretty standard. Those are fine. Uh, the one in the middle, I what a number to throw out there. Uh, the, almost like find, a though. baseball team, the the pretty, over-under. Pretty, pretty good find, though, right? Yeah, I mean, that's a that's a good one. I, I Scouring for what Indiana might do against Michigan, uh Something else. All right, you know, read them and weep for everybody. Let them know what you're going with this. Right. So, in case you're not watching the YouTube channel, so the the crazy one that I have, and not crazy for taking it, crazy because this is an actual number. In Indiana is playing Michigan this weekend. Now, Michigan has their rivalry with the Spartans next week. I'm not going to take Indiana to cover. I'm not that crazy, but I think they can score a touchdown. And when I say that, that's because that's all they got to do. Indiana over five and a half points. I need six points this week from the Hoosiers. That's it. I also took Washington State to cover the eight and a half against Arizona. Arizona, really tight, heartbreaking losses the past two weeks to USC and to Washington. I'm guessing they're out of gas, and Washington State is a pretty good offense. I think they can cover eight and a half. Um, I think it's actually down to eight if someone down to eight now if people really want to um, jump all over that. I've said all week, I think Kansas State plays a good game. I think Texas Tech plays a good game. And so I think it's going to be pretty tight without um, throughout the game. I would be surprised if this did not hit. Kansas State, Texas Tech, the biggest lead for any team, under 14 and a half. Like, do you really think someone in this game is going to have more than a two-touchdown lead? Yeah, and think about what it took for Oklahoma State to get – more than a 15-point lead last week. It was, I mean, an all-time bad performance by K-State. It just it doesn't seem likely. I, I think it's a good one. Uh, I, I see a 3-0 and week out of you, D.Y. I really do. I think I think we're looking at uh, at a good performance and a good showing from you because I also I also like Washington State uh, this week because uh, your, your logic and reasoning for it was very good with how uh, Arizona has played back-to-back tight games that they have still lost. But they probably seems unlikely no they can do it. Yeah, <laughs> like, well, and they're also going back to Jaden Delora as their quarterback this week, which hilarious to hear Jed Fish's reasoning behind that. Uh, I I laughed at that this week. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm with you on that one. That's that's probably something that I'll have to, to get in on with you. All right. Are you going to get in on the Indiana over five and a half? Um. <laughs> 
That one's I, I, that one's so gimmicky. I, I don't know. I, I kind of want to. I'm not sure if I will. However, I did look. I mean, Michigan has given up six points in every game except one against East Carolina this year. Uh, Bowling Green got six with two field goals in the second quarter. UNLV, Rutgers, Nebraska all scored seven, and then Minnesota got ten. So Indiana can find a touchdown in there somewhere, right? Like, got it. They got it. They got to. There's no way they can be that bad. Why, why would anybody playing for that goober, Tom Allen, not want to score a touchdown? Uh, here are mine this week. I'm taking the over on Friday night, Fresno State, Utah State. Look, Fresno State's a good team. Utah State, kind of a mixed bag of tricks, but one thing that they aren't, is good defensively. There have been a ton of points scored in every game they've played in this year. I think almost every game they've played, the total's gotten to like 60. Uh, and then Iowa State, at one point, they were five-point dogs at Cincinnati this week. They're, it's down to like three and a half now. I just think Iowa State wins this game. I, you know, Iowa State, for as bad as we thought they might have been, maybe they're a little bit better. And Cincinnati already sucks at scoring touchdowns when they get to like the five-yard line. Iowa State's defense, even though they've lost some guys, I think they're still pretty strong. Uh, so I'm taking Iowa State money line Ooh, this week. I have a tough one. That. Matt Campbell has already lost in the Buckeye State once this year. That that is true. That has happened. But I think he looks at it and you know, this is a revenge game. He does not want to lose to another school from Ohio. Uh, so he's going to take care Where's of his daddy. And <laughs> yeah. And then I'm going to get back on the wagon. It did not work out for us mm. last week. But I'm taking the first quarter over of 12 and a half between K State and Texas Tech. I, I think number one, you can't trust this K State defense to not give up points early in the game. And then number two, the K State offense is going to come out very, very focused. And if four of the first five games of the year they've scored a touchdown on the opening drive, I'm banking that they can do it again. So I, I think I think everything's back to semi normal for K State and, and and how they play this weekend. So I'm taking the first quarter over. Some places you can probably get it a little bit lower, but even the 12 and a half, I like. I think I think they accomplished that. So uh, we'll hope we'll hope for a better outcome this week than you know Miami and uh, and you know their game last week, their disaster with Georgia Tech. I'll share a few others that I like this week that aren't in my top three, which is something I like to do every week. We don't just put those three out there, but Kentucky minus two and a half against Missouri. I like oh, that. Oh. I think I think Kentucky's a lot better than Missouri. That's just the Blue Cats. Do. And if you are in for sicko bets, I got one right up your alley. UMass playing Penn State this week. <laughs> Penn State's looking ahead towards the Buckeyes. Penn State, Ohio State is in a, like a week, right? Mm -hmm. So Penn State, probably not going to take UMass seriously. I like UMass. Plus 42 and a half. Go on. Why not? And if you want an upset special, I can't promise this hits, but I like the value. Pittsburgh money line because Louisville coming off a big high from beating Notre Dame. Yeah. I mean, look, Pitt is a, they are a team that has not been great this year, but they've been in games. And I told you before we started, that I look at them as they are eventually going to win a game against somebody this season. And Louisville does kind of seem like the prime candidate let down. And, you know, there's no way they're that good, right? Like, that's how I would kind of look at things. So uh, I, I like that one. I think that, that is, uh, that's, that's a good choice there. All right. Uh, moving on now, let's take a quick look around the Big 12 before we give our final thoughts on K State, Texas Tech, pick our players of the game, and then what our predictions are. For this one, for the Big 12, again, another week where there are just five games. However, uh, by the time that you're listening to this on Friday morning, there will already be one game in the book this week. Houston and West Virginia are playing on Thursday night. Uh, do you want me? To, do you want me to just take a stab and be, you know, talk like we know what happened in that game, and I can either be wildly wrong or or wildly incorrect? Well, I, I'm not going to pretend to absolutely feel confident about what's going to happen in that game. What I will say is. I think this is a very tricky spot for West Virginia, actually. Okay. Well, explain. What, what are you thinking? I well, Houston has been a very polar team as well, where they have shown up to some games, and, and if they don't show up, they just get blasted, right? But mm -hmm. West Virginia is a little high and mighty right now, probably being overvalued too much, to be quite honest, just because I think they've had some good fortune with how their schedule has unfolded. 
Pittsburgh not being good. Te- they got Texas Tech at the right time. TCU not being good. Like West Virginia is not as good. Like I'm happy for Neil Brown. Good guy. He's actually easy to root for. Um, a very likable person. But I just think that they're going to be crashing down to reality. And remember, this is a team that we thought was the worst team in the Big 12 before a season. Just because they've had some good fortune doesn't mean they're so much better than that. Um, Houston is capable, especially being at home, and especially having Dana Holgerson as your head coach, that probably is a little bit hungrier against the team that used to employ him. Yeah, no, very, very, uh, very, very good point there. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is this is good. This could be fun to see how Dana Holgerson looks. He's going to look disheveled and everything. Uh, I'm just going to talk like West Virginia won, though. I think West Virginia wins that game. I think Houston sucks. Uh, West Virginia finds a way to do close? it. No? I do think it's close. I think it's I. I don't think so West I, Virginia on a Thursday night goes down there and just blows the doors off of Houston, see, but I think it's close. I I think. Houston wins or gets blown out. Like, I don't think they know how to lose close. You're probably right on that. I mean, I'm, I, West Virginia wins. West Virginia continues to be the best team in the Big 12. There's no denying that, right? Yeah, you know, they're going to be 3 0. <laughs> they are, they are best Virginia. Oh, I, I, I'm going to ask you a question, and this is not necessarily Big 12 scoreboard related, so we'll get back on topic after this. But I want to know if there's enough people to actually think the same way as I do. The, like you see the coaches polls and you you see the AP polls. Who would you have number one in the country right now? Because uh, I would have something completely different. Let's see. Right now, who would I have at number one? Um, I mean, we've we've talked about this a little bit, and I think that the answer is probably, man. It's well, again, it's not like Michigan. It's not Georgia. It's not Texas anymore. And although Oklahoma's win was impressive, like they played nobody before that. I mean, I don't know. I I have a tough time because I, I think I know what your answer is still. I think that you're still Oregon. yeah, I was gonna say, I think you're still on like the duck the duck wagon there. I'm on the duck wagon and and it'll get proved right or wrong this week when they play Washington. That'll be a fun game to to, to monitor. I just you know, my only thing like looking around I, I i actually wouldn't argue with some people that are putting michigan number one because they have played absolutely nobody but they also look the best well they do they, they look the most and, dominant they looked at, yeah because of who they're playing but in terms of just the product that i see if you if you're you people know football just watch the game oregon and michigan i think are the two best right now uh georgia did get up for kentucky and and showed a good flash though yeah that's true I, it's probably Oregon just because I think that they've played a little bit, you know, they've played some testier teams and they've been able to win, uh, and, and kind of handle most of them. I mean, Texas tech was their closest game, but other than that, um, I mean, I, I think that the case could easily be made. Whoever wins Oregon, Washington this weekend, you should feel like you have a legitimate gripe and an argument to be number one, uh, come Sunday afternoon when, when the polls come out again, because, that will be whoever wins that will have the best win of the season to this point. And I think both of those teams are really, really good and legitimate playoff contenders. Uh, so, but Washington right now, they, they don't have the, any of the wins near what Oregon has. And they've been a little, you know, a little tight in some of those. So I would probably side with you that it's Oregon, Michigan. They've played bad teams, but they've dominated them. And the defense again, still seems real. I'd be okay with them, you know, being there. Um, it's just tough. I mean, I, here's the thing. You're not going to like this. I'm not an anti-Michigan guy from the standpoint of, I think so many people wanted to like kill Harbaugh and get him out of there when it's like, I don't know. I think he's doing like a pretty fine job compared to what they've had for basically my entire life with Rich Rod and Brady Hoke. And so I'm glad things are working out for him from this sense. He's a goober. They're probably pretty disgusting up there. Michigan people are probably not the most enjoyable in, in everything, but I am happy for him. Um, I just, their schedule is disgusting to look at as well. I, man up, man up, Jim, you know, drink your milk with your shirt off somewhere else, but make sure that you're scheduling some tougher teams. I, that the schedule is so, so, so bad. So uh, if Michigan had played like one team that I actually respected in the non-con, 
I probably would have given him a little bit more credit. Although UNLV's playing well right now. They I think they just put up like 40 points in three straight games for the first time in school history or in like 100 years. So I guess shout out to them. Uh, I'll, I'll get this thing back on track here for us. There is the, the, the Big 12 scoreboard for the weekend games. Iowa State at Cincinnati at 11 a.m. on FS1. KU at Oklahoma State, 2.30 FS1. And then BYU, TCU at 2.30 and K-State. Uh, at six with Texas Tech on FS1. The BYU yep. TCO game is on ESPN. It is a day full of FS1 Big 12 coverage. So just lock in. Yeah, I was going to say it's the Big 12 triple header on FS1. Um, I know you're all over Iowa State there, but I, I don't know that I feel that way. Um, they haven't been great on the road. So we'll we'll see, right? We'll, we'll see in the Cyclones. I'm not as confident as you are about what they do. Um, in the Buckeye State where Matt Campbell grew up. Look, on paper, even with their Jalen Dales is not going to play, I kind of think blindly, since Oklahoma State barely could take K-State down when they played their worst game in like three years. So I'm like, man, KU should just smoke the Cowboys in Stillwater. But I'm a little scared uh, because that that line, I think Oklahoma State's like a three-and-a-half-point dog at worst. Yeah. Like, that worries me for if I was a Kansas fan because I would think KU should be like a seven point favorite or something, or maybe you five or six. I think what how what K State was what 11 and a half, yeah. K State was 11 and a half in Stillwater, and KU's three and a half. Um, I don't know if the Pokes got all of a sudden a touchdown better just because they beat K State by nine when K State played a terrible game, so that line just scream stinky to me so i wonder if like something is brewing there for oklahoma state to, against kansas i don't know um that it just confuses me and then byu tcu to be honest that line kind of confuses me tcu's a five and a half point favorite yeah nothing nothing that the frogs have done the last two or three weeks screams that they should be a five and a five and a half point favorite on the byu cougars so i would say if you're someone that really buys into stinky lines and leans into them, because sometimes that works, then maybe taking TCU and Oklahoma State are pretty good bet. Pretty good bets. Yeah, no, I I think I think it's interesting to see how this play out. I mean, I think BYU is at least going to be in that game for a long time. Uh, it'll be interesting to see if they actually win it because TCU is on to the backup quarterback. They have not played well the last couple of weeks. And obviously, they you know they've let teams come in and, and play them tight even at home this season uh, in, against West Virginia, against Colorado. So I'm I'm fascinated to watch that play out. The KU Oklahoma State game, I just don't have a good read on. I mean, eh, KU got beat around with with Jason Bean at quarterback at Texas. They would have gotten beat around even if it was Jalen Daniels. Just it may not have been as bad. Um, it's just important for people to remember that the KU offense has a lot more to do with who's at their offensive coordinator and not who's at quarterback. Um, I, you know, you can get confused. I mean, that's still – Jalen Daniels is still a better quarterback, but it's not all that different. And you know, statistically, you can look at it, and it's definitely not all that different. Um, I, I'm probably more fascinated in that game to see how Oklahoma State comes out. Like, was Friday a, a revitalization for Oklahoma State season – and do they start doing things and make me think that they're actually a little bit better? Because at this point in time, I still think Oklahoma State is a pretty bad football team that had a good night against a team that played really bad and they got a good win. Do they do something with that now? That's probably what I'm going to be most intrigued by. Me too. Uh, and and then on top of that, I mean, we, Iowa State, Cincinnati. That is, uh, that's probably those are probably two evenly matched teams right there, where they have enough good going for them that they can be competitive with teams, but they're going to kind of get in their own way a lot uh, if you throw somebody better in front of them. So I think that game could be one of those pillow fights where everybody's like flirting with scoring and then something comically bad happens and it's like seven to three at halftime or something gross. Um, but I, I, this is a good weekend for the Big 12, at least for those uh, first couple of games to kind of sort out what's going on with some of these teams. And then, you know, K-State Texas Tech is going to be its own beast with Two teams that whoever wins that game is going to feel really good and like they've they've changed the the dynamic of their season. Whoever loses it is probably going to start having some pretty negative thoughts. Yep. 
it's probably the best Big 12 game this this week. Yeah, I think it is. I think it is for sure. All right, let's move on. Game MVPs for K-State and Texas Tech. If the Wildcats are to take care of business, secure a win in Lubbock, who is going to have, a, have to step up on both sides of the ball and uh, have kind of that breakout performance that guarantees the Wildcats a win? You know, to win and to have that performance, you wonder if it probably needs to be Will Howard or one of the receivers to maybe ignite the passing game. That's just not what I'm going to pick, though. Um, so I'm going to not use what would typically be the typical logic. Who's who's had the best game on offense this year? Because they need someone just to have a hellacious game. Yeah. It's DJ Giddens, so that's why I'm going with DJ Giddens because he's played the best game of anyone this year. I think that's a good pick. I, I think that's probably where I would side to because uh, I think it's where you can probably have the most confidence and consistency coming out of that spot. You give DJ Giddens the ball – and if he's having a good game, you can keep doing it. It's going to it's going to breed good results for you. So I, I think that's a great pick. I mean, you can look around, you can pick some others. Obviously, if Will Howard were to have a good game, that's pretty telling. That means that the offensive line is playing well. It means the receivers are stepping up, and obviously he's taking care of the football. But I just don't know how reliable those three things are right now. I mean, the three biggest questions on offense – all three of those have to work together to get good results in a football game. You need the offensive line to give the quarterback time to throw the football. You need the quarterback to make good decisions, but also you need his receivers to be open and to be on the same page as him. And if any of that's disjointed, it can throw the whole thing off. You can skate by sometimes with things being a little bit wonky uh, with the the running game because a running back can kind of do it all on his own. So, I, I won't even say DJ Giddens specifically. I'll just – he and Treshawn Ward, like, I think that there was some balance they started to kind of find. I think just finding the the way that you can get those two guys to go off and have a big game for you. I mean, I don't know if you need to put a number on it and say that K-State needs to run for X amount of yards, uh, but I would certainly say that the target would be for the run game to probably get to 175 yards on the ground at least uh, on Saturday night to start giving you a chance there. And maybe if you you start running the ball so well, it can open things up in the passing game. Defensively, we've talked about it in you know the, this, this show itself, about how guys need to get to the quarterback, and, and they didn't do it against Oklahoma State, so you could go there with it. I think, though, that this is probably a game that, not because of the volume of opportunities that I think will be there, but if Jacob Parrish is going to be available – He's going to be the best corner on the field for K-State. And when an opportunity comes up, you can't miss it. You are going to have to be ready to be, be aggressive in going for some balls. I think that's where K-State has to sit at this point right now with a lot of these defensive backs. Is you might get burnt, but hey, you're already struggling in some areas. Take some chances. Step up. K-State's got to force turnovers. And I think the best area for that to come from is just having somebody be aggressive. So the hope would be that Jacob Parrish is, you know, at his 100% and ready to go, or at least, you know, good enough to be out there and he can make a couple plays for you. Uh, Cause if not, you're just hoping for like the rogue punch of the football from somebody to get it out of Taj Brooks's hands. I like Austin Moore just because he looks so pissed off and disgusted after the loss to Oklahoma state. I wonder if, Maybe not just from an on-field performance, just but from a leadership perspective. If he just takes the the bull by the horns this week, it, he probably did, and can really get the ship righted and get people's focus back to where it needs to be. I, I really, in that way, I really really like what Austin Moore could do for a team's performance on the field by how he conducts himself off the field. All right, give us uh, the your prediction for how the game plays out and then a final score yeah i think texas tech plays a really good game because they're really feeling good about themselves and they kind of righted the season and revived it enough to where they can say hey we're we're competing for a big 12 championship again just like we thought we might be i think kansas state plays a really good football game because they want to redeem themselves from a very future performance last week to play inspired football and if they win they can look down the barrel and see a path to where they're still competing for a Big 12 championship once again, just like they thought they would be. Two two teams playing really good football. At the same time, 
you got to like the home team a little bit in that in that scenario, in my opinion, especially when you can't just outright say that Kansas State has a better roster than Texas Tech. Texas Tech, Kansas State probably have similar rosters, or maybe Texas is a little better. I don't know. But they're the home team. They're both going to be playing well. And I think Kansas State needs to be plus in their turnover margin to win the game. That's hard to do when both teams are playing really, really well. And they're the home team for that crowd. I think Texas Tech wins 34-28. Mm, 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 not good not good there uh hey guess what i i'm i am in the same boat as you i am taking texas tech uh this week and uh look i think that this is going to be a much more competitive game obviously for k-state i think that they do a lot of things well i just my expectation this entire week has been k-state is going to probably come out they're going to play a fine game and they're going to play a game where you don't say that that was a losing performance they just lost and I think that's the outcome in this. Like, uh, too many times it seems like, you know, you need something to happen and it's going to be just, you know, heartbreaking the way it works out. I'm taking Texas Tech 31 to 29. I think a couple of things come in to haunt K State in this game. I think Chris Tennant misses a, uh, an extra point at some point. And so that's how you get to 23. And, I think K-State goes down at the end of the game. They get the touchdown they need, but they fail the two-point conversion again, and they lose 31-29. I think it's going to be that heartbreaking for K-State based off of how things have played out the last couple of weeks. That would be a heartbreaker. That probably is worth mentioning. Kansas State can definitely play a very good game on Saturday and still lose, and that might even be the likely outcome. That's But yeah. that's uh, – that's the situation they put themselves in by losing last week to Oklahoma State because look at it. And you can also look at it this way. They get, they got Missouri at the wrong time. They got Oklahoma State at the wrong time. And the way this, the season unfolded and the schedule played out, they're getting Texas Tech at the wrong time. That's why you can play well and still lose. That could probably happen. Just thinking about it because I almost took this just to be funny, but also this is where it could hit. And you just – jarred that memory because you brought up a scenario where it could hit overtime mm -hmm. it's plus 1000 oh okay all right well keep it tucked in the back of your heads maybe if you're feeling a little frisky you can go out and do it uh real quick before we get out of here uh on the, the topic we talked about it so much at different points this week avery johnson uh what is your expectation for uh avery johnson's usage on saturday night uh, colin klein said on Thursday in his press conference that they've got a good plan for Avery moving forward, but obviously Will will still be the main guy. So does that seem like something to you where Avery Johnson plays, at yeah. least has something involved this week? And I, and I think he should. Um, I think the plan has to at least be something similar to what they did against Missouri. The way I phrased it throughout the week when asked about it by other people, why it's unfolded the way it has. And I was like, yeah, kind of confusing, right? You thought he could help you win against Missouri, but not in the other games. To me, that does I have a hard time reconciling that, but I do think that, yeah, it, just because of what we also saw last week too, you have to react to that a little, yeah. a little bit. I think you have to play, build something around Avery Johnson, at least similar to the Missouri game. Yeah. Uh, one other note out of the, the coordinator's press conferences on Thursday, Joe Klanderman said that both Will Lee and Jacob Parrish are questionable. So, I mean, again, it's maybe best case scenario, both of those guys play, but there's also a world where worst case scenario, neither of them play where, you know, if you'd asked me on Tuesday, I would have said, Will Lee isn't playing. Jacob Parrish seems like he probably will be. So uh, that's going to be, I think, important to, to track for K-State because if not, you're relying on some, you know, some some interesting pieces there uh, at corner to, to pick things up in the absence of those guys who, you know, it's not like that they've had a ton of experience either. So uh, fascinating to kind of follow along and little personnel things to keep an eye on this week as well. One other thing that I'll ask you uh, personnel wise, and we've, again, this has been a theme throughout the week. Do you think we see some variety at who plays receiver in the game? Like, do we see some younger guys maybe get a few more opportunities or do we see him change it up a little bit on who's getting the targets early in the game? At least a little bit. It's kind of like similar to the Avery Johnson thing. I don't know if we're going to see a wholesale change or something drastically different, but I do think that 
there should be at least a few opportunities for other guys. And if they capitalize on those, maybe it does become a much more expanded role. But in terms of a drastic personnel change, I don't know if there's one of those to make it receiver. Like, I, like I, I don't know. Yeah, I don't think it can be drastic. I think that the the only thought would be that hey, maybe you're going to be uh, you're going you're going to try and work some other guys in and hope that you know you just kind of hit you know strike gold while you're digging. Uh, but it's it's on the guys that play the most to just get better and be more productive right. and find ways to do to do some things. Do more with Keegan Johnson, please. Yeah. Yep, give him the opportunity and just go with it. You're going to have to live him die by some of these guys. Might as well do it with the dude that you expected to be your most talented to start the year. All right, that will do it for us. The next time that you hear from us, it'll be after the game in Lubbock where D.Y. and I, I promise this week there will be a video. I will not lose the SD card after the game, and I'm sure you're all hoping that it comes after a K-State win as opposed to a loss. And then Sunday morning, somehow, some way, myself, Drew Galloway, KSU underscore fan will have the Sunday show to recap the game in full. Uh, we'll just, we're still up in the air. If K-State wins, I think it's going to be a late night recording session. Uh, if they lose, we're getting up early and just, you know, trying to sleep it off. And then D.Y. and I back on Monday to uh, tie a bow on Texas Tech and get ready for back-to-back home games with TCU and Houston coming to town. So that will do it for Derek Young and myself. Thanks for watching and listening to the KSO Show, part of K-State Online, where you can find everything K-State Online oriented over on On3. You can also be a part of the conversation over there with the premium message boards and get all the latest and greatest information on K-State football and basketball, as well as team recruiting and anything else you need at On3. Thank you for taking in all the content here at K-State Online.